talking about authoritarianism and the uh, kid just done he's just got a new book out talking about the rules or norms that uh, authoritarian dictators uh, authoritarian leaders operate by you know, compared to all these different ones one of the things about Putin certainly for the last two years and you can see it in all the setups that he's had of late he has essentially isolated himself okay except from those closest to him those closest to him can sit next to him everybody else like macron you know, emmanuel macron president of france sits at the end of a you know a, a 10 meter table mm. when he has his council of ministers they're all sitting 10 meters away from him in these enormous rooms that they seem to have in, in this, uh, russia so if he has isolated himself what's he hearing well, he might hear some people saying, well, I don't know if that's a good idea, but there's no uh, actual serious dissent to what he plans to do. You know, what he is hearing, the information is filtered through those people as well. So he's operating in, in somewhat of a, dare I call it a vacuum, um, but yeah, essentially a bit of a vacuum where he's only hearing, um, oh no, it's actually the echo chamber. He's, he's operating in that echo chamber when what he's hearing is essentially what he says they say back and so on and so forth what they say he says back mm. that's a real problem for uh, a, a world leader now that said everybody has their advisors and those advisors will tell them things but a smart one Zelensky is reasonably smart even though he's a comedian no I should say that that's the wrong way around most comedians are very smart that's how they're comedians mm. um he was has been able to remain attached to the real world um, i think by just not taking himself seriously you know not with the pomp and ceremony of say someone who has been part of the establishment all their life and in fact perhaps their parents have been part of that establishment mm. here's an outsider the classic outsider who says no i'm just an ordinary person who gets to be president isn't that great but i'm here to do the best i can for you know the country uh, the best I can in the best way I can. It's not going to be perfect, right? And it's, you're going to disagree with what I do, but I'm, that's what I'm trying to do. I bet you he has well, his approval rating at the moment amongst um, certainly Ukraine, most Ukrainians is probably around 90%. This there's always someone who disagrees with you, but probably around 90%. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Um, Tony Abbott, when he left, um, when he uh, was well there was a push there was a lib spill and he ended up not being prime minister his uh, popularity was very low when he left because people had decided no you promised a lot and you delivered something completely different mm. we didn't get what you promised and you were not honest with us and hell you're part of that establishment you know, that north shore establishment liberal party establishment mm. alexander downer who is often appears in you know the newspapers and wherever he was an opposition leader and a federal government minister um most people i know oh, here in echo chamber bit but most people i know most political analysts i know um do not take him seriously now this is a person who is the you know the son of a, a son of a politician of a politician he is so embedded in the establishment all he ever says is things that agree with the establishment Mm -hmm. um that's why his nickname has always been lord downer you know he acts like it mm -hmm. and if the, if if the house of lords isn't the establishment you know, i'm not sure what is <laughs> mm -hmm. not that he's actually a lord but point is he has the mindset the mentality that's the yeah. establishment mm -hmm. when people talk about i don't like the establishment that's what they're, they're really talking about they're saying we're being treated differently you know we're second class or another class you know, mm -hmm. ruling class working class well here it's just you know he has set himself up above us mm -hmm. and actually we don't like that we don't like any politician that does that quite reasonably so right egalitarian world and all that mm -hmm. um in keeping with the whole russia ukraine conflict um mm -hmm. another there's 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 the two arguments of okay um as you mentioned russia is is bad they're attacking ukraine we have to go defend defend ukraine and help ukraine um 
uh, and Putin wants to recreate the Soviet Union and 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 all that. Uh, there's the other argument, and I have to admit, I kind of lean towards this side of things, where it's way more complicated than than that. And I would say this conflict could be a little bit of our own creation, our own fault on the West. Um, when the Soviet Union fell, we we basically imposed the shock doctrine of, you know, economics on them. Absolutely. We made things so much more worse for the Russians. Yeah. I mean, they, they talk about Russian collusion with Trump and, 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 and Putin, which turned out not to be true, but we did that during the 90s. But nobody's proved it. Let's be clear. Nobody's proved it yet. <laughs> well, well, yeah, but, but, but my point being, we, there is plenty of proof that America did do that with Yeltsin back in the 90s oh, yeah. election. Yeah. Yep. So, we, so there was that there. And then um, once Putin came along, uh, he initially wanted to be part of the West. He, he initially wanted to be welcomed and he wanted to be you know uh incorporate russia into you know this new russia post-soviet union into the world but it seems to be over the time from the bush administration uh all the way up to now there's been this almost rejection uh, and then this idea of nato keeps on creeping closer they had the buffer zone agreement the, I thought, the minsk agreement i believe yes um and uh, and slowly, slowly, nature's getting closer and closer. And he saw, he saw what happened with with uh, Saddam and, and Gaddafi and, and all them. Yep. And I, I think part of this escalation uh, or this problem today is a lot of the people, both in the establishment, but even everyday people, still have a, almost a Cold War mentality. They still think Russia's communist. Hmm. You know, and um, uh, I, 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 I would I would say that um, they don't take that part of the story into consideration, what I just said, and also the idea of um, uh, escalation, like we, this could easily go into, uh, Russia isn't a, isn't Iran, isn't Iraq, isn't Libya, this is Russia, this is another America. In, in essentially yeah. the the land mass and the resources and uh, and the Russian people they're but no they're they're different breed of cat I mean they're the ones that defeated the Nazi war machine <laughs> you know uh, they uh, they can take a lot of hardship um, uh, uh, so I, I think I think the unipolar moment has ended and now um, America got so used to not having a real adversary or, or any resistance because like i said all the smaller countries they just had no problem getting into now they finally come across another a russia that's off their feet from the early 90s who, uh, and they they can push back and now the whole idea of escalation and world war three and the nuclear and all that type of stuff mm -hmm. i think it's not getting into people's heads they still think russia is the type of Russia that's either Soviet Union or after the post early nineties, and it's not true anymore. Uh, this whole thing can really get out of control. There's, there's, nah, there's an awful lot to unpack, as you said before. An awful lot to unpack <laughs> in that. Um, yes, I do think people are viewing um, Russia as uh, not the um, timid, broken. Um, Russia of the Yeltsin period, you know, with a uh, drunken, you know, stupidly dancing president. Um, keeping in mind that, uh, it, it, uh, what's his name, um, Putin started within uh, Yeltsin's circle. Mm. Yeltsin um, was the one who was choosing Putin to be the new guy. Um, Russia at that time, oh, indeed, you know, it's it's been this way for quite some time uh, was operated by groups of people you know so not by a ruling party necessarily like this the soviet period is something quite separate now from what we've got post uh the post-soviet period particularly after 
the 10 year break that is the 90s um, gangster capitalism uh, or, you know, we call it mafia capitalism, however you want to describe what the shock doctrine, etc., of um, what occurred in Russia, and indeed a number of the former states and stands, um, their economies were wrecked. Uh, their people often end up far worse off. Uh, living standards in um, Russia plummeted. Uh, uh, death rates actually increased. So a standard of living fell. Um, your health outcomes fell, everything fell. It's only in the last, you know, well, certainly from about the mid noughties to the mid teens, so from about 2005 to 2015, you actually saw an increase uh, in all these uh, elements, which was great, all built on oil and gas, mind you. But nine, nonetheless, the economy was going well, Russians started to feel comfortable again, where they hadn't felt for quite some time. Um, Putin got rid of the Yeltsin clan that had been around him and installed his own clan. Mostly people he had previously worked with. So the people closest to him, you know, there was a really good BBC piece about it. But again, Graham Gill actually went through this. Um, the um, Siloviki, those people closest to him, um, which are their own uh, different form of oligarch, because oligarchs have a, a, a particular meaning in the, the Russian sense. But this is the elites that travel with or around um, Putin. Um, they're very hawkish. They think they should be a new Soviet Union. You know, they think they should be in charge. Um, they have a huge pile of nuclear weapons. This is not unlike how many people in the UK think. You know? We were once an empire. In fact, we're still an empire. You know, mm. so Forms of imperial thinking. Um, now, that's not Soviet Union. That's imperialism. So there's an imperial thought there. This is the problem for America, for the UK, something that the French haven't quite got over, but the Germans got over it quickly because they had an empire for a very short period of time. So they weren't really imperial. Mm -hmm. Something the Chinese will have to grapple with at some point in the future, particularly now that they have uh, theoretically a dictator for life, um, in Xi Jinping, I mean, he may not stick around. He may retire, or he may be toppled. He may be pushed on his way. Always possible. Um, Chinese internal politics is always cloaked, uh, opaque. You know, the what they call it the other day, the black box of how government actually works. Nonetheless, you know, China's watching very carefully what's going on here. And you're right, the unipolar moment's gone. We are looking at what you might describe as a tripolar moment. Russia reasserting itself has a huge nuclear arsenal, 6,000 odd warheads I read. That's a lot. Uh, um, you have the US nuclear war stockpile, and you have China, which has a whole range of weapons. Uh, they've got their own price, uh, space program. They are every bit the superpower uh, that uh, Russia would like to think it still is. It might not be, you know, super, super power, but it's still there. It's still a great power. Mm -hmm. you know? um, if it's reasserting itself in Ukraine, yes, there's, a, as we discussed earlier, the, there's a, an awful lot of um, prehistory that goes with Ukraine and the, the West and the repeated incursions into Russia. Russia has always been seen as a threat to Europeans. Um, particularly the Germans, because the, well, the Germans used to be a lot closer to them. <laughs> they, they did used to have Prussia. You know, they used to have the Baltic coast there through Poland, um, Galicia and the, those areas in Poland. Um, when, or post uh, Second World War, when Poland was essentially just moved towards the West and you know, creation of Belarus, you know, which is in fact formerly Polish. Mm. Um, so it was that creation moved everything sideways to give the Soviet Union a buffer to say that Moscow is not so close to everywhere else so that we can keep the West a little bit further away because they keep on trying to have a go at us. That mentality has never changed. Mm. But now you have a more imperial mentality coming through saying we will have our empire again, whether it's recreating the Soviet Union or whether it's just, you know, um, the, the, the Russian empire as it was 
you know, 100 years ago, 100, 105 years ago now, yes, yeah, that's 105 years ago. Um, if that's that empire, well, yes, that does include Kazakhstan. It includes some of the stands. You know, it includes, include, can include part of Ukraine and Poland and whatever. You know, that's, that's what they see it as. They're taking back Crimea. They're taking back you know, Donetsk and Luhansk. Um, which you know certainly have high proportions of Russian speakers or ethnic Russians. Mm. Um, so all they're doing is partially recreating that. That we don't quite understand that or don't factor it in. Yes, failure. The Minsk Agreement trampled and broken. Absolutely. You know, EU, the sorry, Ukraine saying we want to be members of NATO, we want to be members of this, and that being dangled in front of them. The Baltic states, you know, being you know allowed to be part of Europe, I mean, they essentially always always were treated as that. You know, the 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 Baltic states in Finland have been at various times, certainly in the last 150 years, considered European. But then so was Moscow. You know, when when uh, Russian emperors would hire generals from France or Germany, and they would go and work there. So that says it's part of Russia. You know? Catherine the Great saw it as part of, uh, uh, sorry, part of Europe. Um, part of Russia, part of Europe. Uh, the dividing line, though, is that uh, the Russians are still Russian and the West still sees itself as different. You know? uh, and it seems to see that them as what we want to keep them there. right? And the Russians are saying, you keep on trying to get closer. You know, go away. We don't want you as close to us. So yes, there's a lot, a lot to be said for that, um, that particular argument. Um, where this ends up, um, I, I, I fear greatly. Um, if if Putin had been super successful right, uh, in the first three days of his attack, if he'd captured Zelensky in the cabinet in the centre of Kiev, had taken Kharkov. Uh, and curse on Mariupol relatively easily, um, it would all have stopped at this point. Mm -hmm. There would be no further bombing because it was meant to be surgical strikes. But the moment that failed was back to standard tactics. And this is the uh, this is the Chechen campaign. We will shell the crap out of it. Right? We will bomb the crap out of it. We'll turn it into rubble, and then we'll send in the bulldozers. Uh, essentially, what after being cashed up by Putin, the Syrian government under Assad did um, to yeah. all the, the the rebels as he saw them there, all the all the civil wars and the, you know the all the different groups, as he bombed the crap out of them, then he sent the bulldozers in, yeah. um, and that's just huge loss of life. Uh, that's a brutal total war. Um, uh, you know, Russians have got experience, as I say, in that in Grozny in uh, Chechnya. That was a horrible year. <laughs> um, but, but also, you know, I, I think there's almost a, a, a intergenerational uh, trauma, a memory with the Russians with World War II. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, that's why they're so protective over that part of Europe. Uh, yeah. um, they, they, and I, I think us in the West, we do not take that, we don't, we don't, we don't recognize it. We don't take that into consideration. Oh. And we go, well, what's the problem? And for them, it's, it's something really concerning to say the very least. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Uh, um, but now I've noticed even, even in Australia and other places too, people who were naturally non-interventionist and they were that during the war on terror and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Something about Russia. As soon as something, as soon as it's about Russia, they just switch that part of their brain yeah. off, and they, oh no, we have to go and fight, fight Russia. Yes. It's very strange. Yes. The the selective, uh, the selective uh, knowledge or the selective arguments. Um, um, it's strange. But, but who so, who have you been talking to, and what is their ancestry? Is it European? Because I bet you it is. I bet you it's Europeans going. We've got to go and fight Russia. <laughs> oh no, no, it's some some Australians like Aussie, <laughs> like yeah, yeah. But like Aussies uncle. are mostly mostly Europeans. Uh, you know, yeah. Were you talking to someone who's Chinese Australian? Chinese Australians and 
you know, new, new migrants from most of Asia, and for that matter, um, the Middle East, um, couldn't care less about Russia, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's Europeans care about Russia. Uh, and people with, a, you know, we're, we're part of the Anglosphere. We, we, we get our information from the US and from the UK. You know, we know, we know far more about US politics than the US knows or cares about Australian politics. Yeah. The same with UK yeah. politics. Mm -hmm. So that means, you know, well, where, where's, our, where's our information? Where's, our, where's that uh, set of ideas coming from? It's coming from the US. It's coming from the UK. Russia is the bad guy. Oh, they're the ones with poison. They try to poison people. It's yeah, like, what, yeah. you, mean, you mean American and, or US and uh, UK and European secret services haven't been poisoning, poisoning people in other countries? Ho, ho, ho. Exactly. Israel with its, you know, uh, you know, Shin Bet and Mossad, you know, going around killing people. It's like, no, look. Lots of countries do that. Hopefully, uh, the, Australia doesn't, but you never know. Well, that, that reminds me of, uh, of of two things. I remember uh, Trump was being interviewed, and he's going, uh, "Yeah, we, you know, basically he said the quiet part out loud." Oh, yeah. And he said, "Yeah, we, we we do that all the time." Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, why are you so? I mean, grow up. <laughs> yeah, he was being more honest than most politicians. Yeah. Yeah. And and another one is the um, whole idea of Putin's uh, KGB. He's KGB. And, oh, yeah, he was. But remember, George Bush Senior was the director, not just an agent, but the director of the CIA. Hey, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, so the idea of him having some actually, I think a lot of presidents, if we go back in the history, had some sort of intelligence connection in some well, way. In, uh, in Russia, it was it was interesting because you know you, you remember it's the triumvirate that, that it's ruled by the triumvirate, which is between the military, um, the KGB, uh, and the party. The military never got a look in in terms of who got to be a leader. It was always the party and the KGB who was mm. making those decisions. Um, no, yes. Uh, if you look, if you watch the death of Stalin, which is a very funny movie, um, it's all played up a little bit. Zhukov marching in, and Beria being the black hat, i.e. the KGB being the black hats, and um, uh, Brezhnev and um, Khrushchev being the well, no, Khrushchev in particular, uh, from the party being the one who's trying to bring it all together. What you're seeing, though. Is it's always it's been the party ideologues, it's been the ideological program, and that which supports it, right? the, the the KGB, which is the one that comes to the forefront. It's mm -hmm. not a military leader. Um, you know, we have governor generals who are military leaders, and we have some ministers who've been in the military, right? That's fine. But we don't have, you know, Major General uh, so and so as you know our prime minister. In fact, that's quite rare. Uh, mm -hmm. to see in nearly all the Western democracies. It'll be a party leader or someone who may have been involved in the security services. Um, less so for most Western countries now, mm -hmm. um, but certainly, you know, you'll not see the head of MI5 popping up as, <laughs> as anything because uh, well, they don't need to. But, you know, it's not, it's, it's uh, Andropo, uh, Andropov um, when he became head of, uh, when he came general secretary of the Soviet Union, he, he was ex-KGB. He was the former head of the KGB. So mm -hmm. there's certainly, you know, some history there of that being available. And so, you know, yes, you know, the head of the F, uh, head of the KGB or colonel in the KGB ends up as, you know, uh, the ends up in the FSB and then ends up I don't know, plucked by Yeltsin from relative obscurity, you know, uh, into a political position and then has made the heir apparent yeah, okay, that seems reasonable. Uh, no different to how many other people seem to find their way into politics. Yeah, I think a lot of that, once again, I, I think people almost have this naivete about how we do things in the West compared to Russia oh, yeah. or other places. Um, there are some differences. I mean, we do yeah, generally yeah. have political parties and elections, whereas they have very few political parties. It really is much more like a clan system. Mm. You know, so uh, it's the, the parties themselves tend not to be democratic. So, you know, uh, Mother Russia, Mother Russia is not, or well, the Motherland Party is not democratic. I forget that for a start. <laughs> you know, 
Uh, but neither is most of the others. Most of them are, you know, not oligarchs, but they're, or they're part of the elite structures uh, and they have certain power within their own party. They tend to be chauvinistic and hierarchical. Yeah, okay. That's different to how our parties are now. If you go back 50 years, oh, yeah, you know, our parties were just as hierarchical and, and you know, male bastions of male chauvinism. So absolutely. Um Democracies do operate differently, though, to um, non-democracies, i.e. dictatorships or authoritarian regimes. So we actually can't compare the two. It would be, um, and apples and pears, it would just be a uh, bad comparison. Um, we think, though, you're quite right about thinking about um, the Soviet, sorry, the Soviet Union, thinking about Russia as the Soviet Union, hmm. or... Well, that's what that's that is in part how we think about it. Um, we've forgotten, and I come back, I've come back to this, um, that they see themselves more as an imperial power, mm. you know, recreating the empire, which is kind of what the Soviet Union was. But the Soviet Union had a very clear ideology. Um, apart from, you know, I'm right and uh, security services are important and we'll use the military on you if you're not careful uh, in Greater Russia, there's no ideology behind Putin. That's power. Right? And if that's the ideology, fine. Right? Um, With Putinism, um, I, I think this is my my perception, at least my uh, analysis. To understand Putinism, you have to kind of understand Alexander Solzhenitsyn. I mean, when when Soviet Union fell, he wrote a book called called Re Rebuilding Russia, hmm. and if you and it basically it was his like recommendations of what kind of Russia should we now have hmm. and quite not if not all of them but quite a few of them Putin has basically implemented hmm. like um uh taking the religion and, br and bringing it back up again mm -hmm. now you got yep. the orthodox Christian as the state religion uh you uh well, being very much nationalistic as opposed you know as opposed to being you know the whole soviet non-nationism with all yep. soviet yep. people thinking more internationalism actually but yeah uh, yeah yeah um uh there's that one there's that one and you it was a few other ones which escaped my mind and and i i i've for de for a while now i always said putin is almost like a throwback to Bizarre. Like he's not yeah, so well, that's right. He's not so but in the that. absence of ideology, he's then reclaimed um a, a set of imperial ideas or ideas that would not be out of place in an in imperial Russia. Right. Okay. Well yeah. hmm. um but uh, keeping with Europe though, um moving away from Russia and, and the conflict there, 